Can everyone hear me? Can you hear me, Stuart? No? Okay, welcome. Um, I'm really pleased that I lost sleep last night over whether anyone would come today at 3.30. Uh, I'm excited to see you all here. There, there's two seats in the front. There, are there any other seats up here? There's a couple up here, so please feel free to move forward. Um, good afternoon, as a member of the DH Lab and Center for 21st Century Study Advisory Group, I'm pleased to welcome you all to the UWM DH Lab. My name is Jasmine Allender. I'm an associate professor of history here at UWM. I coordinate public history and I direct urban studies. So I want to talk for a second about the space that you're sitting in right now. It's a very special space. Um, and it's been the DH Lab for just over a year. And what's happened in this space over the last year is I think a reflection of a grassroots effort on campus to realize what the provost has called UWM's digital future. So over the last year and a half, I've had the pleasure of working closely with three UWM colleagues who've really gone above and beyond the call of duty to make this lab a reality. And I want to give them special thanks. Anne Hanlon, digital librarian. Hold on, we'll clap for all three at once. <laughs> Matt Russell from Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning. They're both co-directors of the lab. And where's the hat? Mark Tasman took the hat off. <laughs> <laughs> who heads our really <coughs> popular digital arts and culture certificate program. So please, let's give a, a round of applause for the three of them. And honestly, in, in, as you all know, we're in a time of serious funding cuts to education, public education from pre-K to post-graduate. So it's particularly important to acknowledge efforts on the part of staff and faculty to move this university forward together in spite of a lack of resources. So the DH Lab has a remarkable list of accomplishments in the past year. We held over 30 events, including a THAT camp, Humanities and Technology camp last May, well-attended Directions in Digital Humanities lecture series, um, meetings of the Serious Gaming Group, and Digital Arts Practice Fora. And with the hard work of Anne and Matt and Mark and the guidance of their advisory group, support from the provost, who will make an appearance later, Eva Barczyk, the director of the libraries, and Rodney Swain, dean of the College of Letters and Science, the DH Lab is an instance on this campus where we've been able to turn straw into gold. We are joined this afternoon by Eva and Rodney, and I would like to invite them both up to say a few words before I introduce our guest panelists. So Eva? Thank you, Jasmine. And I wrote down a few thoughts, except I grabbed the wrong piece of paper. This is my outline for next week's presentation. Uh, so uh, just, we're just wing it. I, well, first of all, I want to say this is just awesome. Uh, you know, it's on an afternoon, Monday afternoon, to have this many people come here uh, to listen to this wonderful panel. And as Jasmine said, we began this last year as a, as a trial because we were hearing the needs and we, you know, there was no funding. There was, you know, but we said we had some space let's make this happen, let's test it out, let's see what, let's, let's see what evolves. And you know, clearly we've addressed an important need here. And I think now we're in that phase of looking at what does digital humanities mean to our campus? How is it interpreted? Uh, how else can we work together? And as you heard, this is a collaborative, you're waving at me. I'm waving at Mark. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I can wave back, but that's okay. Uh, I mean, this is really a collaborative approach. We in the library couldn't have done it alone. We've done it with LNS, UITS, with help through our digital humanities advisory group, and you know, some funding was put together, and we're we're developing a plan looking forward. And so these types of events and hearing these just underscores the need uh, as we move forward. And I think it's wonderful that it's in the library, that because we serve everybody on campus, and, and uh, collaboration is our middle name. And furthermore, this is Open Access Week. So I think one of my colleagues, Tim Britton, had a basket here, and this is very, uh, also very fortuitous that it's this week. You know, we support open access, and the output of digital humanities, much of it is open and accessible to others. So, you know, a nice, uh, you know, opportunity here this week. 
So I will will stop here, and I want to just say have a wonderful afternoon, and thank you for coming and supporting this. I carried my own piece of digital with me, though I'm not going to open it to talk about it at all. Uh, my name is Rodney Swain, and I want to welcome all of you here today. Um, I want to say at the beginning, thank you, Anne, Matt, Mark, also to Jasmine and to Eva and to the Center for 21st Century Studies for hosting this event today. Um, many of you know that uh, about a half a dozen years or so ago, I started interviewing candidates in uh, the humanities and the social sciences. And every time that one of them would mention the phrase digital humanities, I would stop them and ask them to define that term. And it ends up that over the five or six years that I've been asking that question, I've seen the, the answer range in sophistication from simply using a digital source, publishing a website, to actually using uh, the digital world to access, to interpret, and to analyze data, and then to present that data uh, worldwide. So I've really seen the answers vary a lot. Um, it's a critical time for our university to take up the issues of what are the digital humanities, what do they mean for us in terms of scholarship, what do they mean for us and how we relate to the external world. Uh, from a practical standpoint, it's very important that we actually understand how these efforts can count toward our scholarship within the university. Um, I've had conversations with Jasmine over the years about a lot of the work that she does, and I've asked her, um, how, how is this work treated? And it ends up that in many cases, Jasmine and I think others in the college have, main have maintained two distinct but overlapping areas of scholarship in order to make certain that it is counted in this digital age. So I think it's very appropriate that we have this kind of forum today to introduce us to uh, the digital humanities, how it can be used, when it should be used, why it should be used, and then how do we count it. Uh, so again, I'm very pleased that all of you are here today. Um, it looks like we're going to have to argue for more funding for, for this particular lab across our campus. And I hope that it becomes a great tool that all of our faculty and students use. And with that said, let me turn it back over to Jasmine. All right, this just in, if you are tweeting, the hashtag is DHCountUWM. DHCountUWM. I hope someone is needs this. <laughs> okay, so today's events were planned in direct response to a brainstorming session that we held in the lab last December, trying to think about how to um, ramp up DH efforts here on campus. And so what we decided to do was to bring in three scholars who could share with us their perspectives on the digital humanities. So earlier this afternoon at noon, we focused really on DH in uh, tenure and promotion policies. And now we have the chance to hear about the kinds of innovative projects that these three scholars have been a part of. So I also would like to thank the Center for 21st Century Studies, the DH Lab, and the Social Studies of Information Research Group, who have all generously co-sponsored today's events. And a special thanks to Emily Clark and Annette Hess from C21 for their hard work organizing. And after the three presentations, there'll be time for your questions. So I'll do, I'll present all three at once, and then we'll go in the order that they are on the blue flyer. So first, John McKenzie is professor of English and director of Design Lab, a media design consultancy at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He's author of Perform or Else, From Discipline to Performance, co-editor of Contesting Performance, Global Sites of Research, and producer of several video essays, including this vile display and the revelations of Dr. Challenger. John teaches workshops internationally on smart media and performative scholarship, and in the fall of 2013, Hobo Art Foundation and the New Theater of Warsaw co-produced Disastronauts, an experimental theater work with dance and theremins based on John's video essays. Cheryl and Ball. And book. And book. And book. Cheryl Ball has an MFA in poetry from Virginia Commonwealth University, where she completed the school's first electronic interactive thesis, and a PhD in rhetoric and technical communication from Michigan Technological University. She received tenure in 2010 using the first all digital tenure portfolio. Ball is currently associate professor of digital publishing studies at West Virginia University, where she specializes in multimodal composition digital publishing and editing and university writing pedagogy. 
Since 2006, she's been editor of the online peer-reviewed open access journal Kairos Rhetoric, Technology, and Pedagogy, which exclusively publishes digital media scholarship. Her newest book, Writer Designer, A Guide to Making Multimodal Projects, with Kristen Arola and Jenny Shepard, is published by Bedford St. Martin's Press. And then finally, Mills Kelly is professor of history at George Mason University, where he is currently serving as the university's presidential fellow. From 2001 to 2010, he was an associate director of the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media, where he co-produced several award-winning digital history projects funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. 2005, he received the Commonwealth of Virginia's Outstanding Faculty Award for his work in the use of digital media in undergraduate teaching and learning. Most recently, he is the author of Teaching History in the Digital Age, published by the University of Michigan Press in 2013. So please welcome John McKenzie. Stay on time here, I'll start this. So I'm very happy to be here and I want to thank Jasmine for inviting me and I want to thank uh, the Center for 21st Century Studies and Emily for uh, helping me get here. What I'm going to do is talk a little bit about uh, digital humanities at UW-Madison. I'm going to focus in on Design Lab and then I'm going to turn to a really wicked problem that I think is facing the humanities and the arts and how design uh, might be able to offer a solution. If I have time, I'm going to look at a class project that I'm hoping to introduce, uh, that I'm using to introduce digital humanities and design at a large scale. And hopefully I'll get to this Global Midwest project, which I hope will connect with you guys here in the future. So let me start off by answering what counts as digital humanities, who or what counts. And um, when I went to Madison, I sat down, uh, when I got there and talked to some faculty, one particular faculty said, who is doing digital on campus? And they gave me a list. So I started finding these folks, and my biggest connection was with the library. And I cannot stress enough the importance of the library. They are a neutral place to do work. And it was Ken Frazier, who was really a visionary, and gave me enough rope to hang myself. I decided early on I needed to, to define digital humanities large, big. And so, very quickly, research computing, that's probably what most people think of when they think of digital humanities, bringing these digital tools to do research. Uh, I think we can also think about digital learning. How is digital technology transforming learning? Also, new media practice. So I know Mark creates studio classes where people are building things. So I think this should be part of the definition. And new media studies. So going out and studying the impact of digital on culture. If you define it in this large way, you can bring in lots of folks. When I started, if I had confined to this, I would have had about two or three, four, maybe five people on campus. This large one was about 50, okay? A large, but there is a fifth circle here, and that is public digital humanities and thinking about how these connect out there. Because what's happening is there, there's lots of scholarship happening outside of the university in the wild. So we need to think about that one as well. So for me, this is who or what counts. It's much larger than just the research component. All that is a crucial part. So. Um, very quickly talk about the, the ecology that I was able to create there in Madison. Um, so I, uh, see the first thing I built was this, some media studios, because Ken Frazier said, I've got some space, well, I'm going to give you a space to create, uh, I said, I want to create a studio space that we can do lots of fun things in, media, create media, study media. He said, I have a space, but you'll have to open it to other folks, and that's what I did. So I started cruising for faculty to put stuff in there. I then got a humanities, digital humanities melon seminar, and I brought in faculty, but also IT people and library people. We worked for a full semester. Rather than just reading and talking the way seminars do, I said, we have an output that's a white paper. We're gonna create a white paper. There was a section the humanists did, there was a section the librarians did, the section that the IT people did. Formal white paper, then I cold emailed this to the chancellor. Okay, out of the blue, and I CC'd all these deans. Ken loved me for doing that. I could say, I don't really know what's going on here. I'm new at Madison. So I just got it on the map. Okay? That was Biddy, Biddy Martin. I think you remember Biddy Martin. She then got some money through the Madison Initiative for Undergraduates that bought 40 million new bucks to our campus each year. 20 million each year for faculty, 20 million went for underrepresented uh, students to come. Brought 70 new faculty, so we had a big cash thing. You maybe not have that opportunity. I was able to build 
a certificate program. We hired five faculty that came in. Uh, I went back and got a second one and created a design lab, and that funds 10 TAs, half a buyout for me, and an associate director. We're set up in the library. I'll talk about that in a second. The library also set up a research bridge to do more of the quant kind of things. And then Ken had a space, a commons area. He said, this is going to be this. And they got some money to bring in people there. So we have an ecology. This is my little, this is a defunct gig room that would sort of bring these things together. I'll say the funding is going out. This is almost gone now because of fun funding cuts. The space is still there, but the PA that was assigned there is no longer there. Um, I also set up a digital salon. Sorry, this is an annual exhibition of undergraduate work. The libraries took that up. That, because of funding, is kind of going away. So the tide comes in, I can build, and the tide goes out, and things go, go away. Um, yeah, so what I want to do now is turn and talk about Design Lab. And so Design Lab is a digital composition center located in the library. It's modeled on Writing Center. So folks come in with projects, and we consult with them. They make 30-minute appointments with us. Uh, I believe that designing and redesigning knowledge are crucial to the future of scholarly communication and higher ed more generally. And what we focus on there is something which we call smart media. Let's see if I'm going to get some sound here. Hello. 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 Hello, baby. Okay. So, smart media are emerging scholarly genres that complement books and articles. Examples, TED Talks, theory comics, any question can be turned into a quest and can be told that way, you can do that in comics, or videos. Okay, so these are the kinds of things of smart media. Scientific posters are also smart media. We've defined about 18, 21 genres here, and we're trying to train people uh, uh, in order to help students make these things because students are already making them out there. I can show you. I probably am not going to play the whole of this, but this is something I made recently. Good morning to the PPA Watch Group. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. This is a project I have my students do called a Cosmogram. The art of photography attained such perfection that the map of a single province occupied the entirety of a city. And the map of the empire, the entirety of a province. In time, those unconscionable maps no longer satisfied. And the Cartographer's Guild struck a map of the Empire whose size was that of the Empire. This is Borges. And which coincided point for point with. My voice reading Borges. <laughs> the following generations, who were not so fond of the study of cartography as their forebears had been, saw that that vast map was useless. And not without some pitilessness was it that they delivered it up to the inclemencies of sun and winters. I like playing this is that pedagogy, uh, the pedagogy that Plato displaced was based on music. The Homeric tradition was encyclopedic, and you learned by dancing. Okay, and a lot of people going back to McLuhan think that the future is going to be a mashup of that oral and literate tradition. So I like to show this just to get a sense of what's at stake. All right, so Design Lab, we sit in a large computer um, uh, lab inside of College Library. It's the biggest library on campus. One million non-unique users go inside the front door each year. And in, through this threshold into the computer lab, a half a million non-unique users. So setting up in a space with lots of people flow was very important. Design Lab is right here. Those are two media studios. I got more money, and I built two brand fresh media studios there. If you go over here, the computer lab with equipment, video, large format printers. We consulted last year, it was our second year, we did 600 consults. We're running still at probably about 25% capacity. Could grow a lot. I want to set up satellites, because this is mostly on the arts and uh, humanities side of campus. My killer users are on the other side, and the engineers, the medical sciences, and those folks. So I have to figure out how to set up a satellite. 
Our Onto historical mission is to democratize digitality, just as in the 19th century public education democratized literacy. I define digitality as the global reinscription of oral, literate, numerate, and visual archives into network databases and the corresponding changes in identity formation, group formation, and world view. To democratize digitality, what we're doing is trying to democratize design to bring practices of video production, sound design, and visualization to potentially all students to make it as ubiquitous as writing. Now, um, I'm now going to turn to an incredibly wicked problem. All right, and now I'm going to run out of time here. Whoops, that's what's supposed to happen. So, over here are our, um, what would I call it? Emerging cultural practices. Remediation, as one medium being the content of another medium, challenges what we call the distinctiveness of media. There's always other media involved. The mashup challenges our notions of originality. This messes with our ability to assess the individuals. This messes with the crowdsourcing between experts and non-experts, which our ones are built on. Distant reading challenges our notion of what a text or an object is when you're reading tens of thousands of them. All of these are leading to reanimations of cultures living and dead for better and for worse. Cultures are now being mashed up. We basically are losing control of the archive. You think about YouTube. How is our field set up though? Mono medium fields. You got visual here, you got dance here, you have theater here. So it's set up this way. It's not very multimedia. Within that, within that division, you've got nasty battles between scholars and practitioners. They tend to, these, the way it's set up, it tends to prioritize 19th century forms, the novel, ballet, classical music, the realist theater. So the forms are kind of archaic. There's a distinction between high and low culture that happens. Basically, if you're in the higher ed, you've got high culture no matter what the object is. All right? And that just kind of comes with the territory. The model is the romantic original genius, both in terms of thinking about the producers and what we are. We're writers. Sometimes I think of Kant and Hegel had prioritized theater instead of painting and poetry. We'd already be recombinant, collaborative, and mashing up all kinds of wonderful things. So, um, also a big problem is the distinction between abstract versus technical knowledge. Usually these folks are in lowly positions these technical folks. At Madison, we've seen a couple of these folks put into tenure line positions. Are they going to make it? I don't know. Okay. So these, overcoming this is a huge problem. How long can we continue into the 21st century prioritizing these forms? Because we've left out things like television, radio, film, graphic design, those arts, comics. Come on, in the 20th century, we need to get those in this position. Check on my time here. All right, lately I've tried, been trying to solve this with something called design thinking. If you're familiar with this, it comes out of IDEO and Stanford. Um, they try to optimize around three things. Human desirability, technical feasibility, and economic viability. In my research and performance, these are, I would call this cultural efficacy, technological effectiveness, and economic or organizational efficiency. Can you optimize around those things? If you're familiar with design thinking, it works through a process that looks like this. What's really great? Empathy. Ethnographic research happens right here. Going a lot of field work. Who are your users? You could do that with this lab. Who are the stakeholders of this lab? Is it just faculty? Is it admin? Is it students? Okay. What is, and you often redefine the problem. Is the problem we're not having enough faculty come in here? Or if you zoom out and redefine it a particular way, and then you can start generating many different ideas, prototype, et cetera. This is the way this works. I'm going to power through this. What's really wonderful about this is that um, it generates something called T-shaped people <laughs> and T-shaped teams. If you have a major or specialization, this is you. This is your deep. What are these transversal skills? Is it communication? Is it writing? Is it collaboration? A wicked problem that graduate programs have now, they produce highly specialized people that are basically only hireable back into higher ed. If they produce interdisciplinary people, they're, they can be hired out, but they can, it's hard to hire them in. So overcoming this problem is a big one, and it's many graduate programs, they're based on specialization. How do you get out of this thing? 
How much time do I have? All right, so at, and right now I'm teaching a class called Stories, Maps, and Media, Designing Wisconsin Experiences. It is, I'm trying to scale up a pedagogy that, that I was teaching for about 15 years with 20. Can I do it large scale? Can I turn discussion sections into production sections? I need TAs that have the media savviness to do it. And so what we're doing is we're working on, I'm having these, the classes are broken up to small teams. They role play as design firms. The challenge is redesign a historical experience for a contemporary audience, right? And one thing we're doing, I'll show this real quick and I'll get out of here. This group worked in a, a, a platform called ARIS, Augmented Reality Interactive Storytelling. Their goal was to take the effigy mounds that UW was built on and retell them. And this is a GPS thing, so you can go out there in the world. And I'll just play this as a demo that the students created. Well, if you start up a game, you read a little introduction about it. And then the first thing to pop up is Aaron Barber, who is the local um, scholar on the mounds. And that gives you some background information on the game that you're going to be playing. Then your first quest is to visit the Native Americans, but before that begins, um, you watch a little video about nature to kind of get you in the spirit of um, preserving nature and preserving the things around us. So then you're sent back to the year 980 and you have to travel to... I'll power this down and say real quickly what they learned to do is to take that research and they storyboard it, they put it into different characters, and you can travel. You time travel through time and also through space. You can either do this by walking across campus, because GPS it'll pop up, or you can do it zip around mode. Um, I'm going to get out of here really fast because there's I do want, I'm going a little over time. So Wisconsin Idos is my crazy interpretation of the Wisconsin idea, translating back into the uh, indigenous and then bringing the Greek. What happens when Greek knowledge gets put on top of indigenous cultures? This happens around the world. It's called colonialism. Okay, that's what that is. So this is the stakes of this are huge. I'm going to close by talking about this project because it could connect back to you guys. Mellon has a project called Humanities Without Walls, but in the global Midwest. It's targeting CIC institutions, but I'm thinking bigger. The proposal I'm working on with some folks at Iowa is called Midwestern Voices, Midwestern Vision, Transmedia Storytelling as Civic Discourse. Can we go out into local communities and do digital storytelling, and at the same time teach scholars to use this media to become public scholars? We want to try to build an infrastructure working with local community organizations, local archives, local libraries. Again, this was really set up for the Big Ten and those other guys, but we're thinking beyond this. We're working with the urban planning folks, with the folks in um, Mortgage, and we're also thinking about extension. Could we take this to extension, and could that basically come back your way? So, um, yeah, that's what we are, that's what I got. I'll be glad to talk with folks afterwards about that latter possibility. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I changed the title of my talk just a little bit because I conflated the earlier session with the afternoon session, so I hope you don't mind. Um, to give you a little background about, uh, about me, in addition to the bio um, that Jasmine read earlier, um, I consider my primary field to be in rhetoric and composition, uh, which I shorthand as writing studies. And within writing studies, I work within the subdiscipline of what has been called variously through its 30-year history, computers and composition, computers and writing, digital writing, uh, digital rhetorics, uh, digital composition, multimodal composition, uh, new media studies, as it's practiced within writing studies. There's a lot of different names for it. Um, I combine that with my uh, background <coughs> in electronic literature to sort of work within the fields that I've uh, been working with then. Um, 
etc. Now, the primary research questions that I tend to address within my subdiscipline are how multimodal writing is taught. So it's a very pedagogically focused uh, research area for me. Um, but that writing and how it's taught isn't just with students, it's with authors. I'm going to talk in a minute about uh, the journal that I edit, Kairos, and uh, how, I, uh, how I'm working with authors and training authors, mentoring them to publish things in our field, as well as teaching that to the students, although I'm not going to focus on the pedagogical component today. Um, this work with Kairos and with mentoring authors and teaching students to become authors has transitioned for me into uh, this newish field that I'm going to call publishing studies, digital publishing studies, which combines the practice of creative writing and for me electronic literature um, with the practice of writing studies and technical communication um, as well as the study of literature for uh, many folks who do this work. So uh, how this plays out for me specifically is with the journal called Kairos. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about this journal. We started publishing in 1996, um, and that's the royal we, because I did not join the journal until 2001, when I was a PhD student at Michigan Tech. Uh, but Kairos has always and exclusively published online because it was its mission from the beginning was to use hypertextual theory, which was you know, au courant in the mid-90s, and the advent of the World Wide Web to produce scholarship in our fields. So the idea was how do we take the affordances of the link and subsequently all of the different media that we were able to add into uh, HTML and different web technologies that became available to us and use that to produce knowledge in our fields. Um, the journal was started by graduate students, but has now become, I call it, it's in its middle age, I would say. Uh, we've grown up a little bit in the last almost 20 years. Um, and in the process of editing this journal, I became, I moved from a section editor in 2001 to lead editor in 2006. And since then, my work has taken a decided shift into digital publishing studies, where I'm focusing on the infrastructure, as John did a good job of setting that up for me, thank you, <laughs> and talking about how the social, the scholarly, and the technical infrastructures of publishing work to promote our field. But before I get into that, I want to show you a little bit about what Kairos does, because if you're not already familiar with this journal, as a scholarly, peer-reviewed, open access journal, read in 180 countries around the world, um, we get approximately 50,000 unique readers a month. Um, you might not quite have a sense of what I'm talking about. So I'm going to pop over to uh, the internet here and show you this is the live version of the journal. Um, and I want to start by showing you uh, a small piece that we published a couple years ago that gives you a good idea of what some of the research questions in my field look like. then goes on to articulate how uh, examples of how desktop G DJs are hacking their desktops through screencasts such as this one uh, to um, enact their arguments. And that's one of the key features about what Kairos calls web texts, which is our word for what you might otherwise call um, an article that gets published in a print linear journal. Um, because these things can only live online and are distributed through the web, we call them web texts. Um, another example, uh, a little bit older one, but one that I, I like to show often, is this piece by Susan Delagrange, um, published in 2009, I believe, um, 
called Wunderkammer, Cornell, and the Visual Canon of Arrangement. Uh, and Susan has a follow-up piece to this that articulates the three-year process that it took to get this piece published and the three different, radically different designs that she had for this piece before we would accept it for publication. Um, but one of the key features about web texts is that the, the design of them often enacts their argument. And so the design's functioning rhetorically uh, in this. So Wunderkammer, curiosity cabinet here, uh, she's designed this in flash and you click on the doors and the cabinet opens up into a 36 thumbnailed gallery that you can click anywhere on any of the thumbnails and get to the guts, the nodes, the internal nodes of the piece, uh, which can be read in any order, although they can also be read linearly. And the key with this piece is that her argument is that the juxtaposition of visuals in, um, facilitates the invention process. And so here she's asking us to pay primary attention to the visuals which appear in a left to right reading strategy in the primary area of reading and often overtake the written content on the right hand side, which as humanists grown up in a discipline that focuses on writing, that's an unusual position for the images to be in and one that Kairos of course celebrates. So you can um, trace the argument of the piece through the different um, those 36 thumbnails from the beginning are rep uh, repeated in the menu across the top. Um, one of the things that, uh, oh, I want to show this one first. Um, this is one of the newest pieces that we published in the August issue. Uh, it's called Satellite Lamps. And it's, I would uh, equate this piece as being um, book scope not book length, because I think length is a, the wrong determiner to use with digital media work with web texts. Um, but this, the intellectual scope of a book, it has multiple chapters in it, and each chapter is rich with both written content and digital media content. Um, this particular piece traces the immateriality of technologies that we live within. It's actually composed by three interaction designers at. Um, at the Oslo School of Architecture and Design, um, where I happened to be on Fulbright last year. So I got to work one-on-one -on -one with these authors, which was really nice. And I'm just going to play a moment of this piece for you. It's kind of mesmerizing. <laughs> Sorry about the audio, it got distorted between here and the speakers. Um, well, I'm just going to leave it on that for a second because it's a pretty picture. <laughs> One of the ways that my scholarship in digital publishing studies as an instantiation of what I would call the digital humanities is has taken the turn about writing about the publishing process of these pieces. Um, for instance, while Kairos has a three-tier peer review process, uh, first we do the staff review to decide whether it's going to go to the editorial board, and then we do the editorial board review if it gets that far, which usually takes multiple revisions before that happens. Uh, then the editorial board has a collaborative discussion about a web text to decide whether we're going to accept it or not. Um, and then there's a third tier where web texts are individually mentored by staff members if they receive a revise and resubmit after the tier two level. We have always peer reviewed web texts this way since the journal was founded uh, it, with slight modifications throughout the years. Um, 
And I've found myself over the years having to articulate this process over and over and over again uh, to lots of audiences, both inside and outside of my field, to help people understand the rigor that goes into these pieces. Um, and that's just during the developmental stage of editing. Uh, we conduct both macro, the peer review level uh, reviews, as well as micro level reviews, where we're giving specific feedback to authors about how to move things, how to change things. Um, because after all, these are primarily uh, English professors and writing teachers uh, who have learned technology as part of their work, but they're not computer scientists. In the rare case, we will have a lovely interaction designer produce something for us, um, but that's not a standard in our field. One of the other ways that I've been writing about this work is, and the irony here, of course, is that most of my scholarship uh, happens in print because that's the audience that I need to reach with this work. People in my field know generally how this works and accept Kairos as a legitimate output for their research, but it's the administrators who are not going to go to an open <coughs> access journal who need to read about the digital publishing processes of journals like Kairos. One of the other issues that we have with this journal, and there's about a dozen journals like this around the world, are pushing things through the copy editing process after a piece has been accepted for review. Um, so, for instance, Kairos has a design editing stage. We have an eight stage copy editing process, eight stages, which isn't actually that uh, dissimilar from traditional print journals, uh, where we do a comprehensive review to make sure that the revisions are done. We do a design editing review, which I'll talk about in a second, and then we do several rounds of APA style editing, uh, and then a proofread, and then uh, an author query, and a staff walkthrough, and a couple other things thrown in there. But it's this design editing stage that's the real key for sustainability of these kinds of journals in our fields. Uh, and that's one of the things that I've found myself writing about quite a bit lately. Um, okay, I'm gonna skip all this. Uh, <laughs> to basically say, for instance, um, the video with the satellites. We have a lot of video that Kairos has published in the last three years. The, the, the server structure that we've used um, has grown exponentially. From three years ago, we had maybe two gigabytes of space on the server that we used uh, that was an in-kind donation from a particular university. Um, that was several years ago. Uh, last year, when I asked uh, our, um, the senior editor and publisher, Doug Iman, who's at George Mason, he runs the server for us, I asked him, so how much space are we using now? And he said, oh, we're up to six gigs. And I was like, ooh, in two years, we've grown four gigs, where the previous years we had, like, not even. Um, now we're at 20 gigs, a year later. So one of these technical infrastructure questions that we have to deal with as editors is who hosts our journal infrastructurally so that we can be sustainable. Um, Doug and I just finished writing an article called History of a Broken Thing, where we talk about this multi-journal special issue that Kairos and four other web text-based journals in our field participated in in 2002. And for many years uh, in between, in the last 14 years, the only journal articles that were, accept that were accessible were the, those in Kairos because of our accessibility requirements and the, the fact that we mandate that everything has to be hosted on our server. All the other four journals either disappeared, even one that was maintained by one of our lead organizations in our field, um, or the links just broke because they redesigned and all the URLs broke. And so some of those we've been able to recover, but not all of them. As I move forward and as I'm at a new institution that has um, a wonderful new dean of libraries, uh, I'm really excited about how this work will be taking me forward um, in digital publishing arenas. We're going to build a, what we're colloquially calling a DH center, but it's essentially a digital publishing institute at West Virginia University uh, where the libraries has now um, taken on the university press and we're gonna to partner to do a lot of outreach efforts pedagogically and community oriented as well as research. Um, 
one of the biggest projects that I'm working on right now based on my expertise with Kairos and the research that Doug and I have been doing in this area, not just on Kairos, but in all the journals in our field that work like this, is this project called Edit Me. Uh, it stands for Edit Multimedia Environments. And it's a content management system that will take, that will help sustain multimedia journals, as well as print-based journals, as well as books, as well as data sets. Whatever artifact it is that you can imagine publishing, Edit Me will be able to handle the content and take it through uh, authorial collaboration with editors and authors through the peer review process in scholarly multimedia, which is a difficult proposition at best to do that collaboratively, uh, through the copy editing and production processes, all with version control and all of the best practices that we've built up over the last 20 years in this field. I'm pretty excited about this. We've just submitted the grant to Mellon and that project should start in January. Uh, and that will be housed under the Digital Publishing Institute in the library at West Virginia. Um, and I will stop there and be happy to take questions later. Thank you. So first of all, I want to thank the organizers for bringing us here, to Jasmine, to Peggy, to everybody for, for bringing us here. It's really great to, to, to be here, to see such a great crowd. Um, I'm going to talk just a little bit about the, the work that uh, we're doing at the Center for History and New Media and what my small piece of that is. The, the Center for History and New Media, now the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media, began um, in a kind of an oddball sort of a way. Um, our founder, Roy Rosenzweig, who was one of the great labor historians of the 20th century, um, Roy's primary uh, means of exercise was that he went to the gym and got on the Stairmaster every day and would, and would just walk and watch whatever was on the screen that the gym had put up. And this was a long time ago now in the early 90s, and some of you will remember the famous uh, model Fabio, he of the very long hair and the very big pectoral muscles, and um, was used for like um, bodice ripper cover art. And Fabio was talking about his new CD-ROM. And Roy was watching that and he said, geez, this guy is more advanced with technology than I am. This is just unacceptable to me and so I have to learn something about it. And so he started um, writing the first digital American history textbook, Who Built America? And out of Who Built America, he generated some a little bit of money. And Who Built America, by the way, is still being used in high schools all around the country. It's amazing. I mean, it's, I don't even know what platform it works on anymore. But, um, but so some of the money from that, then he went to the dean and said, you know, we need to get a little matching money here. And we, I want to found something called the Center for History and New Media. And that was a corner of his office with a grad student parked in the corner. Um, that was in uh, the Center for History and New Media uh, began in uh, 1994. We're hitting our 20th anniversary of the conference coming up shortly, and um, the uh, the we now have about 65 employees in the center. Um, uh, our funding is about 95% soft money. Um, so those of you who chase grants know what that means in terms of the workload of the people in the center constantly chasing one more grant. Uh, I love. You know, John's stories about money because <laughs> some of that's not soft money. We don't we don't have any hard money, but um, so the center has three primary areas of work, um, and you can see them across the top there: teaching and learning, research and tools, and collecting and uh, and exhibiting uh, information online. And that's really where our focus has been um, over the last 20 years. Uh, my main piece of that has been in teaching and learning and in collecting. And I'll just show you a couple of projects that I've been involved in. Uh, but before I do, um, anybody here a Zotero user? So some Zotero users, yeah. So this is one of our one of our efforts. My contribution to Zotero, by the way, is the name. That's it. I have no further contribution. Um, it was originally going to be called Firefox Scholar, uh, but that was a two-word name, and that's not so good. You need a one-word name, and um, all the good URLs were taken. And the staff was trying to figure something out, and I'm an East European historian, and I said, you know, why don't you try Albanian? Because there just can't be that many Albanian URLs yet. 
<laughs> you know, it's not a popular language online. So they checked, and Zotero actually comes from an Albanian verb, um, which means to uh, to like to collect and organize or something like that. So so anyway, no, to master, as in knowledge. That's what that's what it comes from. So this is my one big contribution to Zotero. Zotero is now used by about two and a half million people every day. Um, it's an open source platform, so it's really that's in terms of our research and tools. Zotero is our biggest uh, tool of all. Uh, my own work has largely been in um, teaching and learning, and I'll just show you my most recent project, which we completed in 2009. Uh, it's timed well now because now we're hitting the 25th anniversary of the events of 1989. Uh, and uh, so this is a project really targeting both teachers and students, um, and especially high school teachers and students, because the typical European or world history textbook that is used in the high school curricula around the country kind of ends around the end of the Cold War, sometimes not even getting quite that far, and usually the teachers are rushing, you know, just before final exams or the AP tests come up, they're kind of rushing through all of that. And, um, and when they teach it, they often teach the version which um, focuses on this, which is that Ronald Reagan run, won the Cold War. And so there he is at the Berlin Wall. This is the moment where he says, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And, um, and that's kind of this, this grand narrative of Reagan won the Cold War. And, um, and this is a fairly uncomplicated and easy to remember version of history. Uh, but those of us who do East European studies know that it's a little more complicated than that and that other people were actually involved, like, for instance, um, anarchists had a big role to play. This is a, a Polish anarchist pamphlet. It's a little different, you know, an elephant engaging in something that only an elephant can engage in. Uh, <laughs> but a little different from Ronald Reagan winning the Cold War. And um, the, uh, the, the sources that we put out there in this project are very different. I mean, Ronald Reagan's there. You can watch the video. Um, and by the way, just to give you an idea of the challenges that those of us face in um, digital history and digital humanities, so when we were building this project, we wanted um, a variety of videos of famous moments in the end of the Cold War. And, and one of those is um, Reagan's speech to an evangelical Congress in which he, some of you will remember this, he gives a speech, it was the evil empire speech, and then at the end of the speech, he turns and looks back at the microphone thinking that the TV cameras are off and says, we begin bombing in 10 minutes. And, and you know, it's a joke. He was just playing a joke with the, but it's not a funny joke, like <laughs> nuclear war, not so funny. Um, the cameras were still on, and so this was a little distressing to a lot of people. Um, so when I contacted the Reagan Library, I wanted the Mr. Gorbachev tear down this wall speech, and I wanted the, speech, the evil empire speech to this evangelical Congress, and the presidential libraries are wonderful places, and they sent me the video. And the one, the evil empire speech, came without that little joke at the end. And so I called them, and I said, oh, I need the last you know, 30 seconds there with the, the bombing joke. And they said, oh, yeah, we don't have that. Really? I didn't save that. I'm kind of dubious. But, so we don't have that on there. But um, th these projects, and I've done several projects like this one, are, are organized, organized around the idea that digital makes it possible to provide to students and people teaching students and to the general public who might find their way here sources that they wouldn't find in a textbook or in a printed book of sources because it's just such an incredibly diverse set of sources. If you're creating a textbook, you're creating, or a textbook reader, you're creating something that can be used by the kind of the mass of people. You're sort of hitting the middle there. We don't have to do that with digital. It's one of the things that, that digital makes possible. And so we're able to include all kinds of oddball sources, but then how do you teach those? And so every project that we do has interviews with scholars, they have teaching modules, they have case studies where educators, veteran educators, talk through how they work with these kinds of oddball sources as opposed to the more standard ones that you would find in a, um, in a textbook. So this is one of the things. We create this scaffolding for, um, uh, scaffolding really drawn from the scholarship of teaching and learning that uh, is available both for teachers and for their students. Uh, on this particular project, the scholar interviews are also fascinating because they're interviews with five different historians um, about why they think that communism just kind of went poof in 1989 after so many years of being so entrenched. And they give five very different answers. And so the students can, and we ask them all the same questions and we have video clips of them answering those same questions. And so the students can either watch five people answering the same question and giving five different answers, or they can watch one interview all the way through. So it's, it's somebody who teaches with it, it's been really useful. Um, a second kind of project that I've been heavily involved with is the collecting of uh, history online and this creating these, we've done a lot of um, open archives 
Um, the Hurricane Digital Memory Bank is, is the one that I was the executive director of. Our September 11th archive, digital archive, um, was the Library of Congress's first digital, substantial digital acquisition. We, it, was, it was kind of a great moment where we handed over the hard drive to them with the, with the digital archive. It was actually a blank hard drive because they hadn't figured out yet how to access a, a large digital archive. They had to spend about another year figuring out the accession process for working with that. Um, so, it was, but it was their first born digital acquisition. Um, that uh, that archive contains about 185,000 individual digital objects. The Hurricane Digital Memory Bank is uh, it's over 30,000 at the moment. It says 25 on the website, but we're over about 30,000. And these these open archives really challenge us as scholars to figure out what to make of them. And the reason that they challenge us. It's because we're used to an archive, as historians or other kinds of scholars, we're used to an archive where somebody has curated that material um, and chosen very carefully what goes into the archive and what doesn't. With an open archive, anyone with access to the site can tell their own story. They can upload their own photographs. They can, uh, they can a lot of people, there are a lot of you know, flash videos in here and things like that. They can just add things to the archive, willy-nilly. And so as scholars, then we have to start trying to make sense of that. And, um, and that's a whole different problem because it's not something that we're used to. Um, and the great advantage of that, John talked about the democratization that happens. Well, this is the democratization of the archive because instead of having a filter, I mean, we have some filter because, you know, spam bots try to put things into our archive and we don't let the spam bots do that. But people can put in whatever they want. They can write whatever story they want. And who knows who most of those people are? because they are not required to tell us who they are. We ask, and most of them say, but they're not required to tell us that. So, so as scholars, we're, we're constantly trying to figure out now how to, how to make sense of these open archives, because they're just a little different from what we're used to. Um, uh, people doing studies of, um, uh, of uh, uh, texting, for instance, have started, to, uh, have started to pay attention to what's in the uh, September 11th digital archive, because this happens this archive was created beginning in 2002, which was kind of early on with heavy texting. And that's just when you start seeing the texting acronyms, the new abbreviations, they start really appearing in large amounts. And so people who work on, on that kind of abbreviated speech look back into the archive because that's where they're starting to see some early examples of it. Uh, we also do um, a lot of work at the Center for History and New Media to provide resources for people who want to display digital content. And Omeka is our single largest uh, project along those lines is really designed for small museums and libraries to um, to display the the work that they've created, um, and uh, and so now around the country, thousands of cultural organizations are using and individuals are using Omeka to display their content, but the back end of Omeka is also. Uh, very robust because it requires the use of the Dublin Core, so um, so all of the data that people put in is all very uh, interoperable and, and useful across a whole variety of platforms, uh, and so uh, and it's also an open source project. Um, it, not all of our work is open source, but a good a good bit of it. And of course, all of it's open access. But people also, including me, also use Omeka in their teaching. I have a I have a course that I teach. I have. A variety of interesting titles for my courses. This one's called Dead in Virginia. Uh, Virginia's full of dead people. Um, they don't tend to rise up out of the ground on Halloween or any other night, but they still remain there in the ground. In Fairfax County, where our university is located, there are 405 family cemeteries and containing somewhere between one and several dozen gravestones and, uh, and a variety of dead people. And so the, um, and those are historic sites that students can research. And so I teach this course, Dead in Virginia, and, and, and it's both to teach them the beginnings of local history in connection with local um, public history organizations, but also to teach them some uh, information literacy, how to work with a database, what the Dublin Core is, how to make sense of these, these standards that archivists set, um, and why, the, why we set them in this way. And, um, and so they begin, and then they learn to display their information online. And, uh, and they have a final work product that they can show to people in the end. So they are, in this particular class, they are not permitted to use PowerPoint for their final or Prezi for their final presentations. They have to drive it out of the database, which is a little different problem for them. Uh, and then finally, uh, I'll just show you one project that I'm not involved in, but it comes from our center. Uh, and this is the Old Bailey project that we've done with colleagues in the UK. 
and uh, this is one of many digital humanities projects around the world that's um, oriented around the, the digitizing of gigantic quantities of text. So the Old Bailey is the principal criminal court in London. Um, and so from 1674 to 1913, there were 197,745 trial records, criminal trial records, that we and our colleagues in the UK digitized and have made fully searchable. Um, I don't know how many million pages of text that represents, but certainly a couple of million. And, um, and so, and you can cut through this database in a whole variety of different ways. Um, somebody's presentation I saw not long ago, which I thought was really interesting, showed that, um, you know, working through it algorithmically, there's a moment in the late 18th century when if you were a woman accused of a violent crime other than infanticide, sometime in the late 18th century, your odds of being convicted for that crime exceed the odds of a man accused of the same crime. So murder, uh, you know, whatever violent crime it might be, prior to that moment, men were convicted more often, but they were more likely to be convicted for that crime than women were. So the accused, if you're an accused woman, there's this moment where those lines of conviction cross in the late 18th century, and they don't cross back. Up until 1913, when we stopped digitizing, those lines don't come back. So something, the algorithm identified for this historian that something was going on in the late 18th century about perceptions of women's criminality in the context of violent crime, infanticide separate from that. And, and, uh, and so there's something really interesting there. What that was, the algorithm couldn't say, but that's where then the historian goes in and starts to look. And so instead of trying to look at 197,000 trials, the historian can look down at a few years or maybe two decades worth of trials to try to figure out what's going on. And uh, this is really one of the great potentials for the digital humanities is in the, in the mass digitization of texts. And, and you, know, you talked a little bit about just digitizing or looking, sorting through the, just all of the issues of Kairos yeah. and, and trying to make some sense of that. Well, um, as these large databases of text become more and more available, having the tools to work with them is crucial, and then teaching students how to do that. Because we don't, we don't teach our undergraduates how to work, how to do algorithmic searching of massive databases of text. We show them that it's possible, but we don't teach them how to do it. A decade from now, I think we'll be teaching them how to do that. And, and so that's going to be a really interesting uh, teaching and learning challenge for all of us. So those are the kind of brief remarks I wanted to make. Keep us on schedule. And now I'll turn it over to Jasmine for you want to moderate the question and answer? Sure. <laughs> who has questions? <laughs> and for who? It's on our job. <laughs> Somebody has a question. Sure. Tammy. <laughs> I was going to keep the question to myself, but yeah. I'll share it. Um, so I, I really appreciated that. There were a lot of people actually, I appreciate all the talks that were wonderful. Um, I, but a lot of people mentioned the idea of open access. And um, well, I, I think you talked specifically about the open versus securing an archive, which um, I, about, or mm -hmm. yeah. I was a little bit skeptical of, and I was wondering if you could talk more about what you mean by the open archive and how it's not curated, although your last example um, started to convince me of that, the old daily, the fact that you had brought in all of these digitized um, materials and that they're fully searchable and... Yeah, so there's sort of, there, I think there are like two things in two questions in there, maybe. Yeah, about and, the, what, the, and, and so, so the first is the democratization of information. Mm -hmm. So having access to 197, that 197,000 trials, all you need is a, is access to a web server. You, know, you need an internet connection, and then you can do that. And there are tutorials in there to teach you how to start cutting through the data if you want. Mm -hmm. And um, and so. Uh, you know, this is this is of course was from the early days of the web. This was one of the great promises was to provide uh, democratic access to information. And um, you know, so many of the of the projects that have gone on do just that. And, um, and or the projects that have been created provide just sort of access to anyone to all this kind of information. And then people start making of that what they want. And so that's that's one. That's sort of democratization of access. And then there's the democratization of um, deposit, the open archive like the Hurricane Digital Memory Bank. So each of you 
was alive in 2005, and perhaps you remember something about Hurricane Katrina and Rita and Wilma that all ravaged the Gulf Coast in 2005, you could sit down, you can go to hurricanearchive.org and sit down and enter your own story about that. I remember back then, and here's what it made me feel like, and a friend of mine was from New Orleans, or I used to love going there, and now I don't. You, know, you could write whatever you wanted and deposit it in the archive. And that's different from a, uh, when an archive is building a collection around a particular subject, and they start acquiring the papers of this person and the papers of that organization or the image collection from here, and they, they go through, and first of all, they target those collections because they're rich and large, usually. Um, and, uh, and, but they're a famous photographer or you know, the National Guard working on the Gulf Coast, uh, as opposed to you and me. And, and so the Open Archive provides researchers with uh, contact with a whole group of people who wouldn't have been there, wouldn't have been represented otherwise. So when we built the September 11th Digital Archive, uh, I, was, I did the Shanksville piece of that, the, the small bit. Uh, and uh, drove up to Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Has anybody been to Shanksville? It's, okay, now it's a national monument uh, or a national park. At the time that I was there in April of 2002, there was just an abandoned strip mine that a plane had crashed in. And there was a gravel road that went up to a parking area, a gravel parking area with some fencing there to keep us anybody from walking down to the crash site. And there were things which people had left there, sort of like you maybe been to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial where people leave things at the base of the wall. Well, there were people, you know, they left teddy bears and flags and, and there were whiteboards that they could write on with Sharpies. And, you know, it was just very ad hoc, right? And, um, and you know, Chase was a tiny little town, 300 people maybe, um, in a very depressed area. And um, so the number one, so people from the community used to have volunteers up at the crash site at the parking area just to help people get back to the interstate, because that was always the number one question, how do I get back to the interstate? Um, and because they were lost getting there in the first place. So, uh, but it was, it was very ad hoc. And, and, and so I went there to try to get people to write their stories and put them into our database. I met two people in Shanksville. I must have met 100 people in Shanksville. I met two people in Shanksville who had ever written something online other than an email. And both of them were newspaper reporters. It was it. The idea that you would sit down at a computer and type your personal story of, a, of an event like that and post it into a database was, in 2002 was just beyond that. They just couldn't do it. And, and so we had to teach people how to do that. We had to sit in the public library there in Somerset and show people how to actually do that and have volunteers at the kiosk. And that so, uh, but then they started doing it. And, and those are stories that were captured in that way that wouldn't show up in an archival collection otherwise, unless oral historians went around and started in it, knocking on doors and interviewing people. So, so it's a different kind of access. Yeah, it seems to me to be about kind of the shifting of where the curation process takes place. Right. And I'm working in the Gulf Coast area, so I'm very familiar with the Media Ecology Project, mm -hmm. which is trying to create greater accessibility um, for scholars. Um, uh, to media archives, um, film archives, mm -hmm. specifically. Uh, and I guess uh, one of the things that we're doing, we're finding that the archives, you know, they're, they see the role of the scholar as creating meaning around these documents. Right. And they want uh, annotation to be done by the experts. And so there's that shift, but then there's the scholars who don't want to do they want to work on their own projects that relate mm -hmm. to their scholarly interests. And so we're, we're, we're trying to work through some of those issues. And, um, but then it's going to kind of create a feedback into the archive, and that's going to help create yeah, greater really accessibility for the archive. So we're trying to find the balance mm -hmm. of labor. You know, if you help us, we'll help you right. uh, kind of thing. So it's an interesting thing. But I, I was talking to someone who's um, the director of the, uh, the the uh, Eastman House in Rochester, and he was saying there's a, a fundamental misunderstanding by scholars of what archivists do, and that you know, we have to try to work through these things. And, you know, and, and he, his perception of the archive was that something was uh, um, that it was something that was open mm -hmm. um, already, uh, which 
I, I see that how, how that, that kind of openness is really in the deposit, that mm -hmm. kind of curating process, and the access. There's a, yeah, so there's a kind of, yeah, it's, I'm still trying to, I do see that. I, I'm right. still wondering. It, it's, it's just, in, it's a little hard to wrap your mind around. Yeah, in the access. Mm -hmm. Right. So everything that we do at the Center for History and the Media is open access. Mm -hmm. um, some of it is open source, but everything is open access. And I'm, um, I'm kind of militant about that. Um, I, you know, I've done a lot of work with the National Endowment for the Humanities. They've been very generous to me over the years, but they've also funded some projects that uh, late in the last four or five years where access was not entirely open. And I think that's really problematic because, first of all, it's taxpayer money, um, and second, you know, why is why, why are you creating uh, resources for teachers or students or scholars that only some people can have access to and others can't. And uh, that, with public money, that, that really bothers me. Thank you. At Kairos, we've had uh, access, not just open access, but we've mandated that any media files that we publish have to have, um, have to be accessible to any kind of reader who might come. Uh, whether it's a neurodiverse reader, or a blind reader, or a deaf reader, um, as some examples. And this is, uh, it's shaken up our, our process a bit, um, because I've had to kick a lot of stuff back to the authors mm -hmm. and say, look, you know, disability studies is part of our field, right? It's part of a lot of fields. It's, you know, one of those umbrella things. And these are concerns about the accessibility of our research. And it's not just about whether, you know, the three deaf scholars in our field right now can watch your video with the voiceover. It's whether the researcher who needs the transcript of the video can cite the sentence that they need to cite from the video 10 years from now, when the video no longer works, perhaps, right? So there's all sorts of issues about access and accessibility that expand beyond open access or that aren't limited to that you know, free or not thing that we often talk about, um, that also have to do with archivability and sustainability. Um, and the main thing that we've done at Kairos in order to, to help authors think differently about the labor practices of creating transcripts is to remind folks all along, as much as we can in public pre pre presentations about the journal, that transcripts are essentially a version of scripts. And scripts are like a version of a storyboard. And if you're doing multimedia work, then you should have some sort of compositional documents that you can turn into a more formal version that will help other readers at the end of the process. So if you're creating these things as part of your compositional process, why not formalize that just a little bit so that you can use it and then thus make your work highly more accessible across different channels once it's published. Um, because, you know, YouTube transcripts, automatic transcripts only <laughs> work so well and sometimes uh, can produce some really embarrassing uh, R-rated results <laughs> on accident. <laughs> Question in the back. I have a question for John. Yeah. Uh, and I was very interested in how you um, brought up much older tension between disciplinary and interdisciplinary whether in our individual um, research agendas and how we pull in different directions. But also, um, I appreciated the dilemma in, te in terms of pedagogy and the fact that many of us are connected into subfields that are highly interdisciplinary and the most innovative, innovative work is there. But we really feel that for our, our graduate students, in order for them to, to be trained, you're saying about how they can hire, they can, uh, hire out their students so, in both in those various sides of this issue of the tension, could you just speak a little bit more about how the digital humanities or the, the, some of those uh, venues can address that? that sure. Um, um, so, I think it's, um, I mean, I think all disciplines are interdisciplinary. If you go back to the original discipline of philosophy, it was a mashup of myth and playwriting and who knows what. And they become disciplines when we forget that interdisciplinarity and we start guarding them. So they're all discipline, interdisciplinary. Um, I think interdisciplinary is a good way to think about things. I think it's uh, in relationship to some other things like transdisciplinary and postdisciplinary. 
most people that do tran interdisciplinary work are going outside of their discipline and getting some methods there and coming back and problem solving inside of their discipline. Okay. Um, transdisciplinary work is your problem solving outside of your discipline and David Krakauer in the Wisconsin Institute of Discovery, he's the one that's pushing for a transdisciplinary division of knowledge so we can start tenuring people that are problem solving far from their discipline. Post-disciplinary knowledge is, is where I think, um, uh, so if you think about Foucault and the rise of discipline and this formation and all that our universities are built on, all these other things, I think we're moving to a post-disciplinary society. I call it performativity or the P stratum. Uh, Hart and Negre call it empire. Virilio calls it the dromosphere. So a lot of people, Deleuze calls it societies of control. So we're moving from a disciplinary society into a post-disciplinary society. And that has everything to do with moving from grand narratives, which is what Leotard describes. So revolution, progress, liberation, those are the grand narratives that we legitimated our knowledge for a long time. Leotard says around 1945, this performativity starts kicking in and it's input-output matrices. So big data. Those grand narratives are no longer working so well. We either need to come up with a new grand narrative and maybe these, uh, I mean the fundamentalism around the world, those have grand narratives, but they're pre-modern or some kind. They're not what we call modern narratives. We either, either come up with a new narrative or learn how to play the performativity game or invent another type of legitimation. So I think there is a closure of discipline that is happening and different kinds of power, different kinds of knowledge. I actually think we have enough knowledge, believe it or not. We've got more information than we know what to do with. What we are lacking is wisdom. And that's not going to be the old wisdom, but it'll be some other more holistic thing. It will not be solved by experts, I don't think. The Wisconsin idea was built upon experts going out and solving problems. That model is not going to work. So we need to figure out a different model. Going back to archives, Oral societies produces repertoire. This is, in my field, bodies are what stores knowledge. Literary societies produce archives. We are producing databases. We are still using the old archive model to understand these databases. We need to do this for a long time. We don't know what this thing is, but there's a bridge. And it will be much squirrelier than what the archive was. I mean, you think about a good old film archive and then YouTube. I mean, that's the difference. How, how do you get your head around in YouTube at that big? Will it be scholars as we train them now, or will it be some other thing? And that's the challenge to invent what that other thing is. I think graduate students and young faculty are in a tough situation because they have to play both games. They've got to prove themselves disciplinarity and this new thing. That's tough, and we need institutions that recognize that. That's why it goes back to these tenure standards and what counts as a dissertation, what counts as knowledge, and there'll be huge battles happening. Actually, I have a very, very general question about, you know, what is, um, you know, visual humanities. Um, basically, my question is, like, um, is it a new approach or is it just a, you know, just a new uh, method? I mean, just, you know, it's how deep is that? If I want to explain it in a true kind of story, I will say, like, um, you know, in the 19th century, of course, um, before, before the Industrial Revolution or something like that around that time, um, construction, building construction was like based on you know, masonry, you know, materials, but then after that you had steel and concrete. But in the transition in that time, they used the new material and you know, methods, but still they used the same forms, like you know, they used, you know, instead of having masonry arches, they had, you know, masonry, like uh, steel arches. It was, it was not a big difference, I mean, it was a transition. So I was wondering what we're doing now, like in this stage, like is the kind of, uh, is the way we use like videos, uh, I don't know, GIS, all the you know, web-based uh, stuff that we use, is it a kind of steel arch or is something very different that we can see in modern uh, architecture, which like, you know, just very different things that now we live in that. So this is my question. Mm -hmm. Why did you repeat that question? The, the, and, and the question was, okay, so what is what is digital humanities? So, so that's the short version. That's the short version. Yeah. So so I'll take a, I'll take a first stab and say that I think um, in in the way that you framed it around architecture, I know you're an architecture student, but the way that you framed it around architecture, I think is really fabulous. Um, and it's um, to me. I think there are sort of there three three pieces to the answer, and the first of those is that digital humanities allows us to do things to, to ask and answer questions that we couldn't have done before. 
So, okay, so the Old Bailey, you could ask a question of 197,000 trial records, and you could spend your whole life working your way through them, and maybe by the end of your life you've made it to 197,000. Um, and so just through economies of speed and scale, you can do things that you couldn't have, ask questions and answer questions in ways that you couldn't have before. Historians were doing that in the 1970s. They called themselves cleometricians. But, uh, but so still, it's, it's the, 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 you can do it with this now instead of having to scab nine mainframe time from somebody. So, so, it's, um, it, that's, so that's one piece, is being able to do that. The second is to be able to um, combine information from a whole variety, and you mentioned this, combine information from a whole variety of contexts in ways that we couldn't before. And so, um, you know, the geotagging of information, I think, is really crucial to that since longitude and latitude are a pretty well accepted universal standard. It allows us to start uh, pulling together geographic ways of thinking about questions that we couldn't have done before um, and display that information in ways that we couldn't have done easily before. You know, you, we can make maps in a hurry now as opposed to getting out our colored pencils and our rulers. And, and so, uh, so that's the second thing. Uh, and then the third is that uh, it allows us to um, create new forms. And this is what the, my two colleagues here are really trying to push at. I'm not so much that person, but to push at new forms of representation of knowledge. Um, I, the only piece of that that I really touch is the maker piece and thinking about ways that we can use digital technology to, to remake the past in the sense that we can recreate with digital 3D printing and, and stencil cutting and a whole variety of other things. We can begin to to remake and re-perform uh, things that were performed in the past. So, and the technology allows us to do some of that. And um, whether that leads to big new insights or huge changes, I, I still don't know yet. Um, for me, digital humanities is a funding term. Uh, it exists primarily so that we can get grants. <laughs> Um, because it's just a new name for something that's been around for 30 plus years uh, and has traditions that are disciplinarily based that go back much farther than that. I kind of agree. For me, it's a, a sort of a strategic opportunity to queer the war machine. My mission is to queer the war machine, and that includes the university and all sorts of institutions, and digital humanities is a way to do that. Um, I'm actually moving away from digital humanities towards something called design thinking, you kind of saw this there. And the reason is this, is going back to that disciplinary, I think the trouble with digital humanities is it's now constituted, it's still too much inside the institution and the discipline of the humanities, frankly. We're going outside and trying to problem solve in, and that's fine, that's mm -hmm. absolutely fine. But we also have something to give to the world. And through design thinking, through this empathy, through storytelling, through visualization, this is what I'm trying to do. I'm basically trying to take the things, the good news of this to engineers, to medical scientists, to the business folks, get them excited and get their money and come back to the humanities. <laughs> because frankly, the money that's in the humanities is a lot of work for nothing. Frigging nothing. I mean, seriously. You talk to those, that's million dollar grants. If you want to play with them, you need to learn how to play with them. And that means problem solving outside of your field. That's hard for people to do, because that's what they love. That's why they became scholars to begin with, and I understand that. And so it's, when you're talking to somebody who got degrees in three or four different fields, and I'm always looking to go somewhere else. So I'm a freak, and most people are not <laughs> freaks, so. I mean, if I had to say, taking all of these ideas together and sort of summarizing what, what DH means to me as sort of a theoretical construct, I guess, or I would say it's about openness, uh, pedagogical innovation, um, digital methods, and professionalization of graduate students as a particular, and, and undergraduates. Yeah. I think Matt, one last question. Okay. Uh, question. Did you not have your hand up before? <laughs> I did. Okay. Especially for Mills, primarily. <coughs> so your discipline is history. Mm -hmm. So let's say that uh, you're writing an article for a traditional human history publication, and uh, it's about you know the cultural uh, impressions of uh, women and violence in the late 18th century, and your article includes uh, findings from the old Bailey. Uh, my question would be, how would you cite that if you're just doing a dissertation uh, in history on the same subject and you use this information as a leaping-off point? 
if you do your research, how would you cite it? And would the citations uh, cause any lingering doubts in the minds of the editors or dissertation? Um, so I think the answer to the second question is pretty easy, and that should be no if you do it properly. Uh, they shouldn't have any lingering doubts because, I mean, you'd have to, in the same way that as you were asking that I was thinking about, you know, how did I do that before, you know, when I wrote a book about Czech radical nationalism, well, I cited the archive of the National Museum on Pozhelets in Prague, and, and which, um, you know, which collection and which cartons within that collection and which file within the carton, you know, so we have our schemes for how we cite those things. And so I would cite the Old Bailey online archive, which has a very rich description of the, the archive itself. Uh, and you know, I might cite the about page on that website. Uh, but then I would have to, either in the footnote or in the text, I would have to talk about the algorithmic methodology that made it possible to get to the first cut of that research. Um, and you know, if that was in a dissertation, that might end up in a technical appendix in the back. Um, in an article, it might be just in an extended footnote or a reference to, depending on the journal, some sort of an appendix or end, you know, kind of concluding notes or technical notes at the end. Um, and, uh, and there we start bleeding over then into how that's done in the sciences and in other sort of more technically uh, rich fields than history. And, and I would probably have to look at the way that scholars have done that. But the methodology would have to be described. And um, a really good example of that in the, the non-supermassive database version is um, Laura Ulrich's uh, Midwife's Tale, um, which won the Pulitzer Prize. And you know she's working with one source, essentially one main source. She has lots of peripheral sources, but one main source, which is the the, the, the diary or more more accurate accounting ledger of Martha Ballard, this this midwife in Maine in the late 18th century. And and, um, and so Ulrich has to discuss in the footnotes her research <coughs> method, how she thought her way through these relatively obscure um, accounting ledger entries, and how she got from an accounting ledger entry to a rich description of the world of this midwife in Maine at the end of the 18th century. And, and in some ways, she won the Pulitzer Prize for that rather than for the beauty of her prose in the main part of the text. Because that's really the part that, that you know, in, in method seminars for graduate students, that's the part that we focus on is the footnotes of that book, not, not the beauty of the prose. And so, so you have to find, as a scholar, you have to find a way to make your work explicable to whatever your audience is. And, um, you know, it, so it's doing something like the Old Bailey is a little new, and, and I might spend a lot more time on the footnote or two than I would on, on parts of the actual sort of analytical text. And, and, and that's, that's the purpose of a footnote, isn't it? To, to make, to, to expose the research method and the, and, and, the, and, and the way that you proceeded through that method. And then the text exposes the analysis that comes out of that. Johannes Britz, the provost, has squeezed out of a long day of meetings to join us for a few minutes. So I'd like to invite him to come up and close the session. Thank you very much, um, Jasmine. I'll be short. I just want to thank, um, as she said, I ran between meetings and I said I wish I could stay longer. It's also my background. Mm -hmm. And so John and Cheryl and Mills, if I may be more informal, my name is Johannes. Thank you very much for visiting our campus, for being a distinguished panel for us. I listened a little bit and I thought, I thought we also need collective wisdom in the way we move forward with tenure. I hope we make changes as needed to reflect what we believe in. Every time I visit the lab here, I see a lot of people. It's always encouraging to see so many people attending this time of the day at the Digital Humanities Lab and event. And that just speak volumes of how important we value humanities on our campus. And that's the reason why we have the Year of the Humanities. That's why we have this lab. That's why we, we believe in the human warrior of a university, which is the core of a university. I always say you can never think of a university if you don't think of a university without philosophy. You can just close the door, right? And so I say, I agree, I love the humanities, but I like the money from business. <laughs> so we just make sure that it from works science. better. And science, yes. Uh, and it's not just all about uh, the money that you bring in, it's the reputation, it's your scholarship, it's really the work that you're engaging. We create a platform where you can really make a true contribution to allow people who they want to be. That's why we are in education, and that's the core of the humanities. So I can't thank you enough for what we do on this campus and for you coming all the way from wherever you come, from Madison, etc. Uh, this is just a wonderful event, and uh, I just want to wish you all the best and have a great year of the humanities. Thank you very much, Jasmine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
I think there's some more coffee and cookies, and I'm sure the speakers will stay around if you want to come and ask some questions. Good. That's great.